Good day to everyone. My name is Mr. Maverick Tamayo and I will be discussing today part 3 of the Biology 100 Plant Structure and Function. Plant's importance encompasses its ability to produce oxygen, food, medicine, raw material for everyday products, carbon sink, and of course, aesthetic value. The study of plant is a realm of botany. This scientific body of knowledge emerged during the time of ancient Greek. Theophrastus is considered to be the father of botanical science. Botany as a science does not merely study plants in the macro level, but also it studies ultra structures, processes, behaviors, responses, metabolites, and other plant characteristic and processes. What is a plant? As this slide defines them, plants are multicellular living organisms capable of photosynthesis. With the exception of some holoparasitic plants like the Rafflesia species and some mycoheterotrophic plants like Burmania species. These species have lost their photosynthetic ability. Plants produce a cellulosic cell wall. It produces starch and defined through the long evolutionary history from the primordial environment until terrestrialization. As shown in this phylogenetic tree, the primitive character that is common for all plants is the chloroplast. Contained in the chloroplast is the green pigment chlorophyll, which may be a chlorophyll A or a chlorophyll B. Across varying environmental stress and adaptations, plants have acquired characteristics that enabled them to thrive. During the process of terrestrialization, plants opted to move from a water-filled habitat going to an arid or semi-arid niche. With this, they were forced to develop structures that will allow them to withstand period of less water submergence, that is, the evolved structures like gametangia for reproduction purposes, a sporophytic stage, the alternation of cycle, and a cuticle. More importantly, the cuticle is found outside the plant, that's actually the first layer before reaching the epidermis. The cuticle evolved to prevent moisture loss among their cells. As the plant struggled towards its new environment, majority of them opted for an upright growth. That is, they tried to reach towards the sun, phototropism, while their roots grew downwards, thigmotropism. As a response to the increasing length of the plant, its girth responded to aid mechanical support in the growing plant body. Thus, wood appeared, well at least for shrubs and trees. Moreover, nutrients assimilated by the roots from the soil is moving against gravity. Thus, specialized conducting tissues like xylem and phloem evolved to aid nutrient and moisture distribution all throughout the plant, at least for tracheophytes. Lastly, to aid dispersion and to ensure that there will be a thriving lineage or a next generation, cones were developed for gymnosperms and flowers for angiosperms or the flowering plants together with the seed and other dispersion agents, it were developed to accomplish this goal.
With the long evolutionary history of the plants, it brought nowadays a myriad of plant diversity across biogeographic realms, biomes, landscapes, and unique habitats of the world. Outline of discussion. We will be discussing the plant body. Under the plant body, we will be discussing about the tissues of the plant. Under the plant tissues, we'll be dealing with two types, the meristematic and the permanent tissues. Under the permanent tissues, we'll be discussing different categories. We can consider a permanent tissue as a dermal, ground, or a vascular tissue. The plant body. In a typical terrestrial plant, a shoot and a root system is exemplified. And in a plant body, the shoot and the root system are composed of different organs functioning together. From these organs, they are again composed of different tissues acting synergistically and of course, from this different tissue, there are specialized cells. Thus, the plant body is arranged into a hierarchy. This is an example of a typical terrestrial plant body, which has a shoot system and a root system. A shoot system is composed of the flower, eventually the fruits, the stem and the leaf, or generally anything that is found above ground. In the root system, anything that is subterranean in nature. The organs in the shoot system is derived from the active division of the shoot apical meristem or the sum, while the organs in the root system are derived from the active division of the root apical meristem or the ram. The division of the shoot apical meristem again is the reason behind the, pro the production of the shoot system while the division of the root apical meristem eventually forms the root system. The meristematic tissues. The meristematic tissue is composed of rapidly or actively dividing cells. The shape of the cells in a meristematic region is mostly isodiametric or spherical or polyhedral. They are notably smaller than those cells found in a permanent tissue has a darkly staining nucleus, their intercellular space is generally absent or tightly packed, they are characterized by a primary cell wall, and their vacuoles are very small or sometimes absent. Generally, meristematic cells are immature and young. Their metabolic activity is very low, as they are aimed more on the cell division process rather than producing metabolites. Their protoplasm is also less dense. Moreover, meristematic cells can be further understood depending on origin and location. Meristematic tissues according to origin. There are three categories for meristematic tissues based on origin. That is, it can be a pro-meristem, a primary meristem, and a secondary meristem. A pro-meristem is a group of young meristematic cells of a growing organ. It is the early embryonic meristem from which other advanced meristems are derived. A primary meristem are cells that arose from the pro-meristem 
and make up the apical tip present at the shoot as well as the root promeristem present at the root tip a secondary meristem is responsible for the secondary growth in plants i.e. growth in girth or thickness meristems based on location according to location aside from the shoot and the root areas a special meristematic region common for grass species called the intercalary meristem can be found mostly near the nodal area of the plant a node is a part of the plant where commonly leaves or branches emerge We've been talking about some and ram already, but aside from their location, what is specifically is their function in the plant body? For the sum, it contains the apical initial or apical cells. These apical cells or initial continuously divide to give rise to other cells. The tunica corpus model which is characterized by three layers of meristematic cells here shown, is common for angiosperms, while for lower vascular plants, a cell initial, which is composed of a single cell, here pointed by an arrow, is common. Slide 12. For some applications, the sum includes apical dominance, that is, it is the priority portion of the plant as this will dictate the development of new leaves, branches, or flowers. Thus, some needs a lot of nourishment from the plant body. Removing or decapitating the sum will induce dormant lateral buds to actively divide, thus making the plant robust. This process of sum decapitation is commonly used in horticultural or horticulture to make robust and stunted growing bonsai. The root apical meristem, on the other hand, aside from the fact that it is it produces the primary root of the plant, a protective protective portion known as the root cap can also be found in the same terminal region. These root cap cells are composed of columella cells and peripheral cells. Notably, root cap cells secrete a mucilage or mucigel to aid as lubricant as the root traverses down the grainy and coarse rough soil substrate. Mainly, Root cap cells are derived from the calyptrogen initial. That is, root cap cells are not direct descendants of the ram. They have their own initials. Expounding further on the importance of the intercalary meristem, it is very useful to aid fast recovery after herbivory, mostly in grass species. The permanent tissues. Considering the main attributes of a permanent tissue versus a meristematic tissue, permanent tissues are not mitotically active versus active in meristems. It is specialized or differentiated versus unspecialized and undifferentiated for the meristems. By the way, when we say undifferentiated, the cells does not have fate yet or any specific function. Moreover, they are metabolically active, especially if they are alive, and characteristically, they have various stages of development in their own cell walls, or sometimes called as the perforations. Permanent tissue can be categorized as a dermal, ground, or a vascular tissue.
For dermal tissue, it is the outer protective covering of the primary plant body, like the roots, stems, leaves, flowers, fruits, and even the seeds. The epidermis is part of the dermal tissue. Other examples are protuberances along the epidermal surface, like trichomes, stomata, etc. Mainly, the function of the dermal tissue is for protection, regulation, deter herbivory, and transpiration purposes. In most cases, for woody plants, the epidermis is soon replaced by a thick layer of periderm upon reaching maturity. The periderm is characteristically the quirky outer layer of a plant stem formed during the plant secondary growth. A periderm is composed of the phelem or the cork, phalogen or the cork cambium, and phaloderm or the cork parenchyma. Here shown are the different layers of a periderm. Through the active cell division of the phalogen, cells are either pushed outwards or inwards. The cells that were pushed inwards are known as the phaloderm, while the cells that are pushed outwards are known as the phalem. With continuous deposition of dead cells, a rhytidome or bark may be produced on the older stem or trunks of trees. Ground tissue. These tissue are neither dermal or vascular. Ground tissue serves as site for photosynthesis, provides supporting matrix for the vascular tissue, and helps to store water and sugars. Further, it can be characterized as a parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma. Parenchyma has living protoplasm with uniformly thin cell walls. It mainly functions for storage, food or water, and even translocation or the movement of organic molecules including ions. It can also be a chlorenchyma, a parenchyma containing a chloroplast, or storage parenchyma, like here shown, an amyloplast for starch. The darkly staining areas are actually amyloplast, and of course, transport cells. Colenchyma consists of living protoplasm with unevenly thickened walls. Primarily, it functions for support because of its unevenly thickened cell walls. Sclerenchyma has dead protoplasm at maturity. It aids for support due to its thickened cell wall. It may, in some cases, function for storage. It is composed of fibers and sclerids. The grit in chico and pears are composed of a special type of a sclerenchyma known as brachysclerids. The last permanent tissue is the vascular tissue. The vascular tissue transports water, minerals, and sugars to different parts of the plant body. The vascular tissue is very important as it is the water and nutrient conducting element of the plant. It is mainly composed of the xylem and the phloem. Structurally, the xylem plus the phloem in an association is called the vascular bundle. The vascular tissue is present all throughout and among the plant organs. If we dissect a young eudicot stem, here shown in this slide, we can see different kinds of cell shape aggregated into one bundle. In a young dicot or eudicot, the xylem appears to be larger than the phloem. 
Notably, above the phloem, a phloem fiber cap exists to aid mechanical support, as we, as we wouldn't assume a rigid plant body in the primary growth phase. An air space is also seen as a large cavity below the silent tissue. See photo on the left. Specifically, the photo on the right, we can further dissect xylem and phloem. The xylem here shown contains both the older protoxylem, seen as a remnant above the air space, and the two larger metaxylems. For the, for the phloem, here labeled as the smaller cells as the companion cells, while the larger ones are the sieve element. These structures will be elaborated further. In this slide, it is very clear that a discernible pattern is a key in identifying a monocot versus a eudicot stem in cross-section. By the way, a eudicot is a botanical term generally referring to plants with two cotyledons, while monocot is a general term encompassing the single cotyledonous plants. As shown here, a eudicot forms a ring of vascular bundle around its core, a little peripheral in orientation, while that of the monocot the vascular bundles are scattered all throughout, no pattern. Here labeled also are the different permanent tissues. Sky blue are the dermal tissues, yellow the ground tissues, and violet the vascular tissues. For the roots, a discernible pattern is also exhibited. A concentric ring-like formation is manifested by a eudicot. Here shown, photo on the left. While a cross or X pattern is exhibited by the monocot. Here shown, photo on the right. A more detailed discussion about the root and the stem structures will be elaborated for the next modules. Now, let us just try to dissect and understand further different structures synergistically functioning between the xylem and the phloem. For the phloem, it is imperative that it functions mainly for food transport or dissolved nutrient. A phloem has two main components, a sieve element and a companion cell. Checking further the structures in a sieve element and the companion cell will allow us to understand how these two important structures synergistically function for food transfer inside the plant body. It all begins by understanding that a sieve element have sieve plates. We also have sieve pores and lateral sieve areas known as perforations. Note its cell contents are pushed sidewards and a direct linkage through perforations is established with the neighboring companion cell that appears like a normal plant cell. That is, all the integral org organelles are present in a companion cell, e.g. vacuole, chloroplast, and most importantly, the nucleus. The sieve element and the companion cell function synergistically in accordance with gradient. Before elaborating the procedure, let us first define what is translocation versus a transpiration process. Translocation entails the movement of materials from one place to another, while transpiration is the release of water. For plants, they release water mostly through the leaves via the stomata. We also have here a source cell, let's say a cell that contains a big amount of nutrients, example, the leaf, and a sink cell, a cell needing nutrition, example, a root cell. 
the goal is to distribute the nutrient or food from source to sink. As you can see, nutrients are first handed over to the companion cell before it is released to the sieve element. The nutrient flows through the sieve element. The flow is aided by the perforations and plate openings. The nutrient is again, pa is again passed on to another companion cell, then the companion cell distributes it to the sink. The overall process is mediated by gradient and flow of water. That is, gradient was facilitated by the translocation of nutrients from source to sink, while the water flow was mediated by the xylem through continuous transpiration process. What I want to emphasize here is that xylem and phloem work hand in hand. They are never separate in terms of duty. Dealing about the xylem now, this tissue is for water transport, but aside from water alone, it also conducts dissolved minerals. A xylem is composed of fibers, parenchyma, tracheids, and vessels. See figure on the right. Xylem vessels. In angiosperms, most of the water travels in the xylem vessels. Their walls are thickened with secondary deposits of cellulose and are usually further strengthened by impregnation with lignin. The secondary walls of the xylem vessels are deposited in spirals and rings and are usually perforated by pits. Xylem vessels arise from individual cylindrical cells oriented end-to-end. -end. At maturity, the end walls of these cells dissolve away and the cytoplasmic contents die. The result is the xylem vessel, a continuous non-living duct. The vessels carry water and some dissolved solutes, such as inorganic ions, up to the plant. Kids. These are individual cells tapered at each end, so the taper end of one cell overlaps that of the adjacent. They have thick lignified walls and at maturity no cytoplasm. The walls are perforated so that water can flow freely from one trachid to the next. Notably, ferns and conifers only contain trachids. Here shown, photo on the right. Pointed in yellow arrows are the vessels, while pointed with blue arrows are the trachids. Considerably, the vessels are larger compared to your trachids. I think a portion of this slide was overlapped by this picture, but then I'd just like to emphasize here that xylem vessels and trachids are tracheary elements of the xylem, and there are different distinct perforations in a trachid. It can be annular, spiral, scalariform, reticulate, or pitted. Now, in woody plants, the older Xylem ceases to participate in water transport and simply serves to give strength to the trunk. Then forms the wood, and the wood is xylem. When counting the annual rings of a tree, one, one ring counting is equivalent to one year. That is, the portion of the lightly staining this one, are most of the time produced during spring, while the darkly staining ones are produced during the summer. 
the idea for the lighter and the darker ones is that the vessel or the xylem elements are larger during the spring wood uh, during the spring or in a wet season in the tropical areas because it tries to maximize the assimilation of water when there is abundant rain while during the summer wood it is but efficient to reduce the size of your xylem because there is little water available from the substrate thus the alternation of a larger this um, xylem element and a smaller xylem element producing a darkly staining band will now make one counting of one growth ring so here we can have a counting of three annual rings one two three thus this tree is likely three years old moreover as the plant grows older the pith may no longer be visible, especially for eudicots. The pith will be crushed and will be left as an empty space within the plant. End of lecture. Thank you.